everybody. Thank you very much, Paul. Good morning, everybody. We're very happy to see so many of you present here for this launch of the multi-stakeholder working group on hydrothermal gasification. First of all, we're going to share the best practices for this type of webinar. They're going to appear on the screen. So the first point we'd like to raise is please can you make sure that your microphones are off during the webinar. You can put any questions via the chat that is at the bottom of the Zoom screen in the middle, as you can see on the slide. Um, in the interest of time, we've scheduled several question and answer sessions, either after each individual presentation, if you have a specific question given the presentation, or at the end of the webinar for the more general questions, for example. One last detail, you will no doubt hear us talk about HG. This is the acronym for hydrothermal gasification. There are three moderators or leaders for this session, my, myself, Violet Donna, and Mathieu Morel. Just a few words on the way in which our presentation is structured. Here you have the summary on the screen. First of all, we will focus on the five parts. The aim, of course, is to present the potential of hydrothermal gasification to you and all of the work that is under work within the working group. We'll begin with an introduction on the one hand to hydrothermal gasification technology and secondly, an introduction to the working group. Next, the second part will focus on the role of hydrothermal gasification and how it can contribute to the targets of the circular economy, waste valor valorization, for example. Then we'll focus on the pilots and the demonstrators in Europe. The next part will be on developing the business model. And last but not least, our conclusion in order to underscore the main challenges and targets of this sector. So by way of the general introduction, I'm going to pass the floor over to, to Robert, who works for GRT Gaz. Robert Maculé, he's the director of, director of the project for Bonjour. GRT Gaz. Uh, je peux pas me Good morning. En video. Unfortunately, pas I can't ça. display my Justement, video. Unfortunately, it's not violet. working. It's stuck for some reason. J'espère que vous m'entendez. I hope I hope you're able to hear me, nevertheless. Yes, Par we can contre, hear you loud and clear, Robert. Pas encore. No. Voilà, voilà, ça marche. There you are. Now you can see Merci me. bien. Oui, est-ce que... Voilà, j'ai la main. Bonjour à tous, voilà. Okay. Les petites euh, mises au point, everybody. voilà, que je puisse euh, vous I présenter euh, euh, cette introduction dans, dans la thématique. Je suis très content de, de vous recevoir so, ici, euh, réunis avec nous, euh, sur cette euh, conférence dédiée à la gasification de Tamaï. On va aussi bien vous donner, euh, vous apporter euh, un maximum d'explications sur notre technologie, mais aussi sur la filière et les acteurs qu'on a réunis dans le groupe de travail It's a working group that I set up a few months ago, and today it's made up of approximately 100 actors. So, to get to the heart of the matter, or rather, before we get to the heart of the matter, just a few indications as to the different documents that are going to be made available to you. These are documents that include an educational video, a brochure, a video, and in the brochure for example, you can find the details of how the technology works. You've got the direct explanation of how all of these technologies function and what they mean. And you've got the direct explanation of how all of these technologies function and what they mean. Vous avez également un rapport qu'on a publié en fin 2019, qui a été réalisé avec l'appui de la société Enea Consulting, dans laquelle on a essayé d'identifier tous les gisements de biomasse humide et leur potentiel de production de gaz. Et c'est justement avec cette thématique qu'on va commencer. Let's start uh, out with this specific theme because, of course, for all uh, technologies, you need interest. Uh, you need uh, the actual raw material. Uh, and the first elements of this subject, without which we will not be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. Without saying that we will look just for biomass, we are not going to be able to convey any biomass. L'ensemble doit être resté pompable. 
Est-ce que dans le, dans le système de la gazification de l'automale, qui dans la particularité et de fonctionner à haute pression, bah, on a un risque de, de blocage du système par un, un simple effet de bouchon. Alors, on, on doit faire en sorte que l'intran arrive avec une certaine concentration de matière, de matière sèche. Il ne doit pas dépasser les 20%. Alors, pour revenir aux intrants, voilà les principaux groupes d'intrants auxquels on, on s'intéresse. Euh, vous voyez que la répartition est, est assez différente en termes de quantité. Et les, les principaux, euh, fa principales familles, si on peut dire, sont les effluents d'élevage, les boues et leur digestion de boues dans les stations de préparation. Euh, tout un groupe d'acteurs ou d'activités industrielles dont en particulier particulier euh, les résidus d'agroalimentaire, mais pas que, mais aussi les papetiers, les chimistes, etc. On a un truc qui est lié Et un groupe qui est très important, c'est aujourd'hui, peut-être encore moins, mais déjà, on va dire, avec une taille quand même significative. Aujourd'hui, on est autour de 28 millions. Vous voyez que avec la progression de, de la méthanisation dans les années à venir, on estime que d'ici 2030, on passe à 120 millions, so this is voire the potentiellement à 400 uh, millions de tonnes uh, d'ici 2050, si la, la méthanisation um, va into, globe. And mute the original Au niveau language, des procédés, voilà, avant de rentrer dans le schéma, juste euh, so ex explications au départ. Nous avons une technologie qui, qui, est un peu, qui a sa particularité, qui fonctionne à haute pression et euh, à haute température, supérieure à 221 bar et supérieure à 374 degrés. Euh, ces conditions euh, de, de, de fonctionnement, euh, pourquoi on les, les recherche C'est parce que euh, euh, l'eau change ses, ses, ses propriétés et devient extrêmement réactif. Ça veut dire qu'on um, peut libérer assez facilement l'élément hydrogène qu'on cherche dans l'eau parce qu'on veut le combiner um, avec le carbone qui se trouve dans la matière sèche. Le deuxième effet qu'on cherche, c'est qu'à ces niveaux de température et de pression, bah, tous les solides précipitent euh, dans le réacteur, c'est-à-dire qu'ils tombent de manière gravitaire en bas on peut les sortir et ils ne participent pas à la réaction qu'on cherche. Et, et, et cette réaction, c'est euh, faire réagir le carbone avec, avec l'hydrogène. Alors, pour rentrer un peu plus dans le schéma, vous voyez qu'on amène une biomasse brute hein, qui peut avoir des concentrations de matière sèche relativement euh, différentes. On concentre, on dilue pour, euh, pour l'amener à une concentration, on va dire, dite optimale entre 15 et 20 euh, C'est à chaque fois propre à chacun de Et euh, d'ailleurs, on, on comprime avec une pompe à une pression euh, supérieure à 250 bar. Si à présence uh, d'un séparateur de sel, justement, qui, déjà en amont des gazifures, fait précipiter les solides, bah, voilà, on récupère uh, à travers cet équipement to bah, tous les sels minéraux, euh, les métaux, les métaux lourds, et on garde plus que la partie euh, liquide carbonée, et euh, on introduit dans le gaz de cœur, qui, euh, qui génère euh, oui, un effet de bullage, on génère euh, la, la conversion de, de liquide en gaz, bon, cette, euh, cette conversion n'est pas parfaite, euh, à la sortie on a, on a un mélange liquide-gazeux, euh, qu'on sépare euh, avec un, un équipement dédié à ça, et vous retrouvez d'un côté bah, de l'eau de l'eau claire euh, qui contient son principal composant l'azote hein, qui se trouve dans un cran au départ et de l'autre côté le gaz qui est composé euh, essentiellement de méthane hein, c'est un gaz riche en méthane avec euh, de l'hydrogène plus ou moins selon l'intran et selon la famille de, de la technologie que je vous donnerai quelques, quelques explications après et euh, on a aussi du, du CO2 et parfois aussi euh, la présence d'hydrocarbures supérieurs de, de le méthane euh, type éthane, propane, des choses comme ça on peut tout à fait et accueillir dans notre réseau. Voilà, et d'ailleurs, pour, pour, pour ce gaz qui reste à haute pression, on a une étape d'épuration qui nous permet d'enrichir le gaz en méthane et pour la préparer dans l'injection dans le réseau, soit aussi on peut 
on peut également euh, l'utiliser pour euh, la production de, ca de, de carburant type BioNG ou hydrogène. Juste un petit euh, focus sur les familles de technologies. On a deux groupes hein, de familles, une avec Catalyse, qui fonctionne à, 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 à peu près à 400 degrés et qui génère plus de, de CH, plus de méthane que l'autre groupe. Euh, bah en fait, la Catalyse favorise la production de méthane et la baisse la température de réaction à 400 degrés. Sans Catalyse, bah on a avec un gaz qui est plus riche en hydrogène et un peu moins en CH4 en méthane et qui fonctionne à des températures plus élevées. Voilà, pour passer un peu à la, à la partie des, des atouts, des, des plus values de la, la gazification de la en fait, il y a trois principaux atouts et, euh, et qui sont aussi des, des potentiels de rémunération. Bah, le premier, c'est euh, d'abord un outil de traitement de déchets. Hein, on a une très forte réduction des déchets. Euh, on a une conversion de carbone qui est très élevée, supérieure à 90%. Avec des micro algues on a même atteint plus de 99 euh, ce qui veut dire en, en, en génère à, à un tran égal à peu près deux fois plus de gaz que, par exemple, avec une fermentation, une méthanisation. Et en génère, d'ailleurs, bah, vu que la conversion de carbone est très élevée, très peu de biochar, hein, très peu de, de, de reste de carbone qui, qui précipite. Et euh, on, on garde en, en essentiel des cendres qui sont composées de métaux et métaux lourds euh, sous conditions qui se retrouvent dans les intrants, ce qui est parfois le cas, par exemple, avec les bouts de stations d'épuration. D'ailleurs, on a très peu de polluants atmosphériques, on n'a pas de NOx et pas de, pas de, très peu de CO. Et en tout cas, on reste largement en dessous des, des limites réglementaires. Et d'ailleurs, on produit euh, le deuxième grand atout, euh, je vous en ai déjà parlé, on produit un gaz riche en, en, en méthane et on récupère des sels minéraux, euh, notamment du phosphore du potassium et, et d'autres, euh, avec l'azote soluble, bah, on, on, on pense pouvoir en produire des fertilisants qui sont réutilisables en, en agriculture et on récupère quand même une grosse quantité d'eau. Il hein, faut compter entre 60 à 75 de la masse en intrante. Bah, on le récupère en forme d'eau à la sortie. Et euh, voilà notre volonté aussi, c'est de, 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 de pouvoir réutiliser cette eau. D'autres atouts, bah, un temps de conversion très rapide, une installation compacte et modulaire. Hein, par la haute pression, euh, on va être limité en taille du module. Hein, euh, on pense que 3, 4, peut-être 5 tonneurs va être le grand max par module. On pense pouvoir atteindre un coût, euh, un coût de production euh, compétitif, hein, sous condition d'abord que le, la biomasse intrante ait un coût faible, voire négatif, et que l'État aussi euh, nous apporte son soutien au moins pour démarrer cette nouvelle filière. D'ailleurs, on a, et ça c'est très important pour n'importe quelle filière, on a besoin d'un haut niveau, haut rendement énergétique. Ça va être le cas, on pense pouvoir atteindre 70 à 75 de rendement global. Et si en plus on arrive à utiliser la température, la basse température, la chaleur fatale, comme on l'appelle, on peut même augmenter encore ce rendement. Et en bonus, bah, L'essentiel à retenir, cette technologie permet d'éliminer toutes les bactéries, tous les produits pathogènes. Parfois, on trouve des restes de médicaments, des choses comme ça, voire des microparticules type microplastique également se convertit. Euh, il ne restera plus rien. Alors, pour passer à, un peu à, à notre groupe de travail, quelles sont les motivations qui nous ont ramené à, à nous rassembler bah, D'abord, c'est le traitement des déchets humides hein, qui... On le sait, pour plusieurs, bah, ils ne sont, sont pas ou insuffisamment valorisés aujourd'hui. Et euh, cette technologie permet euh, une quasi-intégralité euh, de, de valorisation du, de l'intrant. Et on va vous donner quelques explications derrière. Et voilà, on, on pense que cette, cet outil, ce, 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 ce mode de conversion, permet de s'introduire, s'intégrer parfaitement dans, dans les modèles d'économie circulaire. Est-ce qu'on pense qu'on est capable de, de, de valoriser quasiment tous les, tous les sortants, comme on les appelle, tous les, tous les, tous les produits qui sortent de, de, de cette technologie, soit-ils gazeux, solides ou, ou liquides Et bien sûr, cette technologie elle participe à la déca décarbonation, décarbonation de tous les secteurs d'activité, 
Et euh, voilà, euh, en dernier, bah, bien sûr, on, on contribue à un mix de 100% gaz renouvelable avec les autres filières euh, comme la méthanisation, la pyrogasification et aussi euh, le power to gaz, que vous connaissez certainement par ailleurs, et c'est aussi bien vrai en France que au niveau européen. Nos objectifs dans ce groupe de travail, bah, c'est d'abord voilà, rassembler les acteurs, euh, multi-acteurs, multi-usages, ils viennent de différents secteurs d'activité, euh, mais on a tous un intérêt commun. Euh, on veut faire connaître cette technologie euh, aussi bien au niveau territorial qu'au niveau national. On, euh, veut, on est motivé pour travailler et définir ensemble avec les acteurs, avec les pouvoirs publics, un cadre national qui permet de disposer une réglementation pour cette technologie, des mécanismes de soutien et aussi on travaille sur les modèles d'affaires et vous allez en, 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 en entendre parler un peu plus tard. Et bien entendu, on veut aussi par cette initiative encourager, soutenir tous, tous, les, tous les initiatives qui ont été prises pour euh, améliorer euh, ce procédé, mais aussi euh, les solutions euh, dont on a besoin en amont et en aval de la technologie pour qu'on puisse euh, au mieux s'intégrer dans cette euh, approche d'économie circulaire et au final, bien entendu, ce qu'on cherche, c'est industrialiser cette technologie au niveau français et ça euh, au plus tard en 2025. Voilà, le GT, euh, euh, sa vocation, c'est de devenir le principal interlocuteur euh, auprès des pouvoirs publics et de tout autre euh, interlocuteur, soit-il euh, de la collectivité, soit de la euh, en dernier, euh, juste un, un petit aperçu sur les, les thématiques sur lesquelles on travaille. Bah, euh, déjà, il y a un, un cadre réglementaire à définir qui nous permet de respecter euh, toutes, les, toutes les contraintes environnementales, de sûreté, de sécurité, des installations qu'on projette. Euh, bien entendu, on doit, euh, doit s'investir aussi euh, sur toute la panoplie d'un cran. On a identifié entre 80 et 100 23 différents. Et bien entendu, on a aussi un, un, une partie de travail sur les sortants pour être en mesure de les valoriser au mieux. Euh, on veut identifier aussi toutes les externalités positives comme négatives de cette technologie, les nombreuses plus-values, pour pouvoir euh, voilà, euh, en tirer le, le, un bénéfice maximal aussi bien pour les acteurs que pour la collectivité. Euh, ça se fait aussi à, à, à travers un apprentissage des projets pilotes et démonstrations existants, vous, en, vous allez en découvrir certains, et aussi par ceux qu'on qu veut monter en France. D'ailleurs, on, on a besoin d'initier quelques études, de voir des, des quelques développements technologiques spécifiques en complément de la technologie. Euh, on a besoin de définir des business models, et ils sont, euh, ils sont propres à chaque secteur d'activité, voire à, à des groupes, euh, groupes d'intrants, de, 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 et vous allez euh, voilà, entendre quelques, quelques informations par rapport à ça. Et bien sûr, d'ailleurs, bah, on, on doit porter les intérêts de cette filière auprès des pouvoirs publics, euh, des acteurs territoriaux et nationaux. Et en dernier, euh, bah, c'est ce qu'on a commencé à faire ici, c'est faire connaître cette technologie auprès euh, de tous les acteurs euh, cibles et, euh, et bien entendu aussi euh, des médias euh, et des pouvoirs publics. Voilà, je m'arrête ici et je passe la, la main à the floor back to one of my colleagues. Alors Emma, on ne t'entend pas. Oui, Emma, on vous Emma, entend pas. Emma, could you please turn your microphone on? Alors, si on n'entend pas Emma, peut-être qu'on peut en directement enchaîner avec Adeline de Thomas de la Carène qui, qui va nous expliquer euh, pourquoi la gaz de thermale pourrait être un atout euh, pour les collectivités locales, euh, et particulièrement le territoire de Saint-Nazaire, euh, à travers euh, ses atouts et, et comment ils s'insèrent dans aussi dans leur, dans, les, dans leur plan climat euh, au niveau territorial. Je laisse la parole à Adeline. 
Bonjour à tous, est-ce que vous m'entendez On t'entend très bien. Ah, formidable. Est-ce que c'est bon pour le canal anglais aussi Ok, c'est ok pour le canal anglais aussi. Est-ce que tout le monde peut entendre Ça dit le speaker. J'ai vu qu'il y avait des soucis avant. Donc, bonne soirée à tous. Je m'appelle Adeline Clamart et je suis en charge de ce qui est appelé Energy Transition et Climate Transition à Caen. C'est une organisation within the regional organization in Saint-Nazaire. I apologize, I'm trying to bring my presentation onto the screen. So Saint-Nazaire, this is the built-up area of Saint-Nazaire. Just a few photos to make you want to come on holidays to the western part of France, but also to show you that above all, ours is a region that is highly industrialized, but also a region with many, many environmental assets, many beautiful areas. We have a certain number of Natura 2000 zones, and we have estuaries that are both industrial, but also very, very rich from an ecological perspective. So this This means that over time, we've gradually put together a trans an energy transition plan and a climate plan that is quite ambitious. If you look at what we have on the screen, we're looking to achieve certain ambitions, major ambitions in terms of renewable energies, both in terms of renewable heat and electricity and biogas in parallel. Our climate plan is designed to integrate all of the different actors. We don't want to just focus on our organization's business activity. Hence, we're looking to involve all of the business sector in the region and to set up as many partnerships as possible. Um, these are partnerships that already exist or that we're looking to set up in order to help for more innovative solutions to speed up the energy, energy transition phase. In 2014, we started out an ecology plan uh, at the port uh, from the eastern part to the western part that you can see on the screen. We covered all, all of the face of the estuary that you can see on the photo, the aim being to get, the, get all of the different economic stakeholders involved so that we could develop synergies. What we want is that the waste from one sector becomes the resources to be used by another sector. So it's with this in mind that we then set up the gasification uh, demonstrator that is currently up and running in our region. The entrants that we've been able to identify and choose and select very carefully are the it's the sludge from the wastewater plant that is close to the site where we're going to set up the demonstrator. And so as far as we're concerned, it's a project that, um, that is one whereby we're looking to, to treat the waste. We're also looking to produce renewable gas and It's an excellent solution to be able to lo locally valorize uh, co-products. So this is all part and parcel of our public policy in favor of the circular eco economy and in favor of uh, climate protecting the planet. From our perspective, we have a solution that is okay. It's only in its initial stages and we need to stabilize many aspects of the project. But we do believe that it will provide a solution to a lot of our challenges. We're talking here as well about the production of minerals that should enable the farmers to exit locally from using local fossil fertilizers. And potentially, we think it could be interesting to continue to discuss and think about creating links to the potential reuse of treated wastewater, wastewater that exits from the treatment plants. Our aim or our hope is that we can use these waters for industrial uses, for um, farming, for example, or in order to feed them back into the water table. So I repeat, this is a project that ticks a certain number of boxes in terms of our challenges. I've forgotten to mention the mobility challenges as well. We're looking potentially to convert our fleet to hydrogen. And this also is the case for certain logistics specialists in the sector. It's quite possible that we'll be able to produce hydrogen in addition to the CH4 at the exit from the demonstrator. And so this is an excellent area for study as well. And once again, it will enable us to get rid of the microorganisms and the pollutants. And during this health crisis that is going on and on and on, well, for us, it's an excellent form of leverage that we're very interested in studying, even politically so, so that we can try and find solutions for our citizens directly. 
directly speaking. So to summarize, hydrothermal gasification for us well and truly is a great solution to um, valorize, to re recycle all of this sludge from our treatment plants. It's harder and harder today to valorize um, all of this sludge. It enables us to get rid of the micro pollutants, as we said, and as a result, to reduce the health risks. And we will also help to increase the share of renewable energies in the energy mix in our local area. And given the fact that our region is quite industrial, six times the average of the Loire region, for example, when it comes to energy consumption. So it's all very positive. And if everything goes well, we should be able to reuse treated wastewater, wastewater that comes out of the uh, sewage treatment plants. So for all of us working on this project, the demonstrator project, we, we want to have an economic model that will definitely enable us to make the project possible and viable. That's our challenge. So I hope I've been clear. That's about all I had to say. And I'm now going to pass the floor over to Joël or Jean-Baptiste. Jean-Baptiste, who's turned his camera on. Jean-Baptiste Castin from CEREMA. Good morning. Are you able to hear me? Bien. So, my name is Jean-Baptiste Castin. I'm in charge of industrial studies at CEREMA West. And I'm going to be talking to you about the circular economy and waste management. And I'm going to be doing so, I'm going to be very brief. So my slide is entitled, The Rules and Regulations for the Management of Waste and Residues is Becoming More Binding, More Complex to Enter Into. So the circular ecology was came about because raw resources are becoming more and more scarce. We need to we need to protect our resources, we need to limit waste and ensure that we're able to recycle them. Hence, since August 2015, the law concerning energy transition in favour of green growth, the LTCV, has, has been voted. It is now part of French legislation. In 2018, it has, always, all, it has also been included in our global rules and we now say that sustainable development is something that everybody has to take, take on board and we have to ensure that we have neutral carbon um, and we have to improve the way in which we manage the circular economy. So in France, we have an objective, which is to have a roadmap for the circular economy. This is the FREC that dates back to April 2018. The aim here basically is to speed up the valorization of bio waste. More recently, we also introduced another law to fight against waste um, and to favor the circular economy. In France specifically, we have a specific law that, that specifies how we have to ma manage waste, particularly waste that is non-dangerous and non-inert. So this is a major form of leverage that will enable us to reduce the amount of waste that is produced and that can be recycled. So without further ado, I'd just like to show you one example following on from Thomas's presentation, the example of raw material valorization. This is for sludge from wastewater plants. 70% of this sludge is valorized through comp composting or muck spreading. We also have a limitation of incineration, and that is in line with most of the regional plans for preventing and managing waste. And we're also moving towards a progressive uh, uh, cancellation of uh, dumping with a European directive dating back to the 21st of May 1991. So reusing uh, sludge from waste treatment plants and uh, making sure that uh, matter goes back into the earth is also one of the objectives. So there are many uncertainties uh, for this uh, sector where sludge is being used. We want to have a common base relative to agronomic quality and uh, uh, lack of toxicity for fertilizing matter and uh, different uh, substances used in farming. At the moment, with the COVID-19 epidemic, the agency, the National Agency for Health, has recommended the forbidding of use of muck spreading. So this has, of course, an impact on that kind of waste management. We're also wondering about composting with the 
uh, ban of mixing sludge with other waste. And we've got another decree that is currently going through a consultation process uh, organized by the environmental ministry. So this general context is based on the development of new ways to reuse and uh, recycled uh, bio waste. So there's a, a strengthening of regulations in terms of muck spreading and composting of uh, sludge and digest it. There's also an, an increase, we're seeing an increase in the general tax on polluting activities. And there's also uh, a challenge with respect to precious minerals such as phosphorus, uh, where we want to uh, close the phosphorus cycle and we want to fight against the eutrophication. We want to re um, remove ourselves from any dependence on uh, phosphate rocks and limit the pollution from cadmium. So we want to retrieve uh, uh, phosphorus. This, this is going to be obligatory in Switzerland as of 2026, for example. We're going to be seeing an, a considerable increase in the number and uh, quantity of bio waste in, in the future. So we need new tools for depollution and we need to uh, use uh, such waste uh, to produce energy. So hydrothermal gasification seems suitable uh, from a regulatory point of view, from the point of view of circular economies, but also for managing uh, wastewater treatment and, uh, stations. Thank you. So once uh, Jean-Baptiste has finished, we can move over to uh, Joël, who's going to explain to us the impact on waste. And uh, it's transformation. Yes, hello. So I'm in the dark. So my name is Joël Tanguy. I'm the president of Nevisus. Uh, so we provide consulting uh, services for uh, organic waste and its management. So as you've been able to hear previously, many matter has been identified for hydrothermal gasification purposes. So between 80 and 100 products or types of material have been identified. So with different compositions, uh, diff they are different resources that can be reused, phosphorus, so organic material, water as well, because uh, we've got a water phase and different pollutants, so micro pollutants, organic pollutants, so trace materials, hormones, uh, drug residues and uh, pathogenic uh, microorganisms. So this is really in line with regional objectives and regulations because all of these materials uh, that go through um, hydrothermal gasification see their pressure increase, their temperature increased, and during a first phase, we recover the minerals. And in these minerals, among other things, we have a parameter that is uh, good to recycle, and that is phosphorus. Uh, we've already heard that. So there's the catalytic, there may be a catalytic reactor, depending on the uh, technology chosen. And behind that reactor, behind that reactor, uh, the water is purified, it's rich in ammoniac. And it can be used for different sectors, different purposes. There are different possibilities that can be explored. So microalgae, uh, use for irrigation, and it can also be used to make fertilizers. So we've got uh, the syngas, uh, CH4 or hydrogen that's also produced depending on the kind of uh, reactor, whether it's catalytic or not. And then there's a, um, a, a gas that's uh, also reused. And we also reuse uh, CO2. We can use CO2 after the purification process. So we meet different regulations. Uh, in the MAFO regulation, the regulation in terms of residual waste. Uh, and uh, we heard about the common base. Uh, we are also in line with those criteria and the, also with the challenge uh, concerning phosphorus. So we want to integrate uh, hydrothermal gasification within a local context. And this is what we're seeing on this slide. And this is what Adeline mentioned as well. If we take the end of the wastewater treatment plants that are uh, focusing on HG, and, and you can have different reuse uh, 
possibilities, so mobility, for example, injection into the gas network with uh, maintained pressure. You can even inject it into the gas grid. So there are also irrigation possibilities that can be explored. And then uh, residual minerals after recovery of phosphorus can be used in the cement industry. And then the phosphorus uh, portion can be retrieved for producing fertilizers that will be used in the agricultural world for feed, for example, and they will then generate wastewater and be sent back to the wastewater treatment uh, plant, and then we will loop the loop again. So this is a concrete example of integration of this uh, technology. It's a great demonstration. So it means that industrial synergies can be set up uh, within a specific area. It means that we can use on what already exists or create a new kind of dynamic that focuses on the uh, circular economy, and that has its advantages. So we, what about extrants uh, outputs? Well, uh, we're expecting some uh, positive external factors. We're analyzing those at the moment. There's a mineral effluent. I referred to this earlier on. We can recover phosphorus. We can, this can be used in different ways. Uh, it can be used in the cement industry. Uh, it can be used uh, as a raw cement. And then ammoniac uh, charged water that can be mixed with phosphorus uh, and reused, but also for growing microalgae. So ammonium can also be used for membrane separation if you want to retrieve the ammonium better and use it as a fertilizer. So you can see that the arrows are pointing in all directions here. And it, it shows the advantage of this technology. You know, you can have lots of different outputs, lots of ways in which it can, uh, things can be reused and recycled. So we can recover nitrogen. And then there's the syngas, which is the, the, the base. As Robert was saying earlier on, compared with methanization, and of course we don't want any competition, but we're talking about twice the production from methanization. Uh, compared with the incoming material, the inputs. So it really is a very optimized system and it can be used for mobility purposes um, because the mobility produces uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then the, the CNG side of things can be advantageous for mobility. It, it really depends on the type of uh, treatment it, and the kind of technology tomorrow we could uh, focus on the use of hydrogen, for example. So there we are. Um, there are things that can be finalized, that can be fine-tuned. We can loop the loop even more. And we can develop new business models because we're talking about a technology that um, is offering a lot of hope and which can be perfectly incorporated uh, in the current context with its different problems. So I'm now going to hand over to the next speaker. Yes, thank you, Joël. We're going to move on to pilots and demonstrators now, and I'm going to hand over uh, Christophe Dubout, who is in charge of development at GRDF. Uh, yes, hello. I don't know if you can uh, hear me or see me. Yes, we can hear and see you. So let me just to make sure that I uh, have control of my presentation. So I think it's working. Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Tristan Rigou. I'm in charge of uh, research and development programs for GRDF, uh, the Gas Authority. I don't know if you can see me. Can we? Can you see? Yes, we can see you. And so I work especially on uh, reusing and recycling uh, liquid inputs, uh, so sludge and liquid manure. So I'm going to present to you the pilot projects, the demonstrators that we have in France and Europe. So we're just going to limit ourselves today to this uh, continent. 
So today, as you can see on the diagram, there are about 10 or so different pilot projects, so demonstrators across Europe. You can see that there are some in different countries. So bottom left, if we start there, we've got some in Spain. There's one in France. It's the CEA uh, that is part of the working group that is in charge of this site. So it has a prototype and I'll show it to you later on. There are also the Netherlands. So the Netherlands are very much ahead of uh, the rest. So if you look at bottom right, it's not a, a, an artificial photo, it's a real photo of, of an installation that I will talk to you about later. So it's a real industrial installation that is in the Netherlands. Then of course there are there's a lot of research in uh, Germany by the Karlsruhe Institute, uh, for example. There's Switzerland as well, notably with Triatech, uh, and we'll hear about its pilot uh, later on. So this was uh, set up in collaboration between Triatech and PSC. So you can already see that it's a young sector, but it is a sector where Already, there are quite a number of prototypes, uh, more and more prototypes, in fact. Uh, so, it, and more than just prototypes, because we've got something industrial in the Netherlands. So, where we are concerned, we're very attentive to the development of hydrothermal gasification in France. And as I said, there's already a prototype that exists in uh, Grenoble in France. So, you can see it's not very big. So you can see that it's a prototype and it's a prototype that's going to be remade over the course of this year. It's going to be redeveloped, it's going to be improved. So this is what exists today and what we're planning, well, for 2021, we're planning to identify targets. In other words, we're trying, we want to identify the type of pilots and demonstrators that we need to set up in France so that we can then move on to the next stage. And so, as well as identifying uh, the technologies, we also want to work on uh, creating consortium or consortiums in the plural. So working together with several companies that can at once design, develop and finance, and of course operate uh, the first uh, installations. So we talked about Karen earlier on, but we'd like to have some other projects seeing the light of day. So that's the plan for 2021. We believe and we hope that we will be able to set up a pre-industrial demonstrator in 2022. Maybe it will be more like in 2023, but we're hoping to do this in 2022. We want to have a, a size that is close to an industrial size. So something uh, like the conversion of a ton an hour. So it says uh, between 200 kilograms and a ton per hour. So that's part of the work that will be carried out in 2022. You know, we want to know what the best uh, technological target is. And then uh, we can also imagine, well, it's, it's actually possible. It's not just a question of imagining. We want uh, to set up an in industrial installation so with four to 20 tons an hour in terms of throughput. So this will be based on a module design. So, you know, the number of modules will allow us to increase the output. So we're talking about uh, quite um, high installed uh, power values. We can imagine that we will be able to produce something like 30 to 150 uh, gigawatts a year. Uh, so that's a, a considerable source of energy. So to conclude, so um, we want to manage to succeed uh, with the setting up something that's more industrial for this technology. So uh, we're working on pilots and demonstrators, as I've said, and our first uh, job is really to work on feedback as well, feedback from the pilots and demonstrators that already exist 
and those that are currently being set up. So that's the first step, I would say. The second step, well, this is something that we're doing in parallel. The, it's important to determine the right conditions for developing an industrial demonstrator. So uh, this is important from different points of view, of course, uh, from a, the point of view of, of technical aspects, but there are also financial matters that need to be considered. Uh, because these installations are quite costly. We're talking about tens of millions of euros uh, to get to the pre-industrial phase. Then there, there are all the regulatory questions. Uh, regulations are not adapted to hydrothermal gasification for the moment. And then, of course, there's uh, there are regional, local issues, um, you know, uh, you know, what, what is the best thing to set up, uh, given that we want to set up a circular economy? So uh, we want to support uh, the setting up of pilot projects to begin with. So by uh, suggesting technological targets, so with sizes, uh, types of inputs, uh, outputs, and adapt these to the site. So it might be a wastewater treatment station. It might be an industrial platform. So these are things that we want to look into. Uh, this, this will all be part of the working group's uh, focus. There's also a need to uh, look into subsidies for this industry. Uh, and of course, uh, financing may be public or private. And then there are questions linked to how uh, such projects will be led and, and how to bring together the right uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Gail Pang, who is the technical director, and he will talk to us about the first pilot unit uh, developed in Switzerland. Hello, can everybody hear me and see me? So it's a pleasure to be with you today to present to you a new uh, hydrothermal gasification unit, which is based on a catalytic converter. So it's a, a technology that was developed by the Polytechnic uh, in Lausanne in 2015. And Triatech is a spin-off, therefore. We've been working several years now on the development and commercialization of this new technology. So here's a picture of our new pilot unit. So this was built uh, at the Institute, so in an academic environment. The building was finished in August 2020. And since September, we've come into an operational phase. So you can see the different technical data of the installation. We've got a maximum flow rate of 110 kilograms an hour. We can focus during the first test on uh, the uh, butch, the, the sludge that is digested. And then we can look at the different types of inputs. So we also work at a, a temperature of a maximum temperature of 450 degrees C. Um, so this uh, is quite high compared to non-catalytic uh, units. So the idea is to show you that the unit can uh, work properly. It, uh, uh, you know, it's also to demonstrate the feasibility of the extraction of minerals. It's also important to um, show how efficient the re reactor is to convert the organic fraction into gas. That's our mission. Uh, in fact, we have different missions, different assignments. So now I'm going to show you to the real uh, installation. So this is a front view. You can see the zone where the sludge is injected at high pressure. We also have a heat exchanger to preheat the inputs. And this is what we see on the right. And we've got four levels, as you can see. Now we're going to move on to some more pictures. So here, you can see the back of the installation. So we've got a view of the four reactors. We've got four reactors. Uh, three have a 50 litre volume and one has 100. So the idea is to have a certain flexibility so that we can work with one reactor, two, three or four reactors, uh, d depending on uh, what uh, production we want to focus on. 
So if you look at the right hand side, you've got the containers with different tanks. This is where we simply collect the different uh, sludge that we're going to work with. So let me show you our roadmap for the next few years. So we should be finishing commissioning between now uh, and uh, a month's time. We're also going to be carrying out tests with model molecules that are fairly easy to treat. So differol, for example, we want to produce gas. So we want to see how the installation works when we're producing gas. We're going to inject different components diff with different salt contents, see how the mineral separator works. And then once that phase will be over, we're going to start tests with digested sludge. And so we'll start, start at a small level and then progressively we'll go to, I think he said 4%. So of course it's an academic environment. So the, and the idea is to carry out one to two week tests. Between now and the end of the year, we want to install a pilot uh, in an installation in a real life situation. So that the idea will be to work uh, seven days a week uh, in a real platform and see how uh, it works, this catalytic hydrothermal gasification unit. And then we've got the commercial phase uh, after the pre-industrial phase. And this should allow us to demonstrate that the technology is completely viable. So I would like to thank all of you. And now I'm going to hand over to Robert. Thank you, Gail. So Robert, you now have the floor. Perhaps you can talk to us about the demonstrators, main demonstrators in the, in the Netherlands with the pre-industrial phase that is currently underway. I'd just like to underline that what we've seen we have a tacit agreement with SCW system that hasn't been able to come to the conference, but uh, they are allowing us to present the outline of their project, nevertheless. So over to you, so I will be taking over now. Hopefully I'm on the right channel this time. Mathieu, can you confirm that I am on the right channel? Let I can, okay. we can hear you, Alors, everything seems to be okay. So very quickly, so the demonstrator in the Netherlands that was developed by SCW Systems and supported by its partner Gazuni, which is the Dutch equivalent of GRDF. So we've got two phases for this project. The first phase that is experimental, the idea there is to test the demonstrator. And as you can see, there are different steps. So first tests were carried out in 2008. Sorry, Robert. Appar apparently, we can hear the French when you speak. The, um, he is still on the wrong channel. So in the globe at the bottom, are you on, switch to the right channel? Is it better this way if I switch it to French? I don't know. Uh, can somebody tell us, please? So I will talk. Can you hear? Is it OK? Is the problem still there? Is it working? Sorry about that. So uh, let's go back to the presentation then. In 2019, the consortium made its first injection operations and its gas was uh, compliant. So the pressure was 70 bar. So this was the, the first time that gas was injected in a compliant manner. And then the, last year, they had authorization to extend their installation uh, and move on to phase two. So moving up to uh, 20 megawatt ton hours. And they had confirmation of a buyback uh, price for the injected gas with a guarantee of 12 years. 
and then this first installation was um, added to four units were added so that it could operate uh, continuously so this is a picture of the illus of the installation itself you can see the different inputs that are used they're stored in two silos here uh, they're pre-treated and here at the bottom left you can see the unit module uh, the unit module and here in the building there will be four units uh, installed and this is where the gas is purified and transformed so where there's a lot of methane and that's the injection station where the renewable gas is injected into the network to be used um, and other natural gases can be used as well so as Tristan showed you earlier on, this is not um, an artificial photo. It is the real installation. And you can see that it's a fairly big building. And if you look at the right hand side, if you look at the top photo, you can see the biomass storage containers and bottom right, you can see the installation that makes it possible to carry out the catalytic methanation of the gas. So using uh, CO2 and hydrogen residue contained in the syngas, so that's uh, also transformed into CH4. So at the end of the day, what can we say? The project is not finished. Uh, there's the commissioning of the four modules to come. After that, as of 2024, they're going to extend the, the installation. So they want to move from 40 megawatts to 100 megawatt uh, TH, and then diversify in 2027 and have something in, in Rotterdam and in the north of the country in Emschaven, so near the German border, again, uh, 250 megawatts, uh, hopefully. And if all goes well, in 2030, the idea is to have six uh, TWH per year thanks to three sites. So this is very ambitious, this plan. So I'll hand back over to Mathieu now. Thank you, Robert. So for the last part, I'm going to hand over to Victor, uh, who is in, specialized in the blockchain. Yes, hello, everybody. Thank you, Victor, we can hear you. So if you have any questions with respect to presentations, then please feel free to ask those questions now and we will deal with them later after all of the presentation. Yes, hello. My name is Victor Degbo, so I work with Sofiane. Uh, hopefully you can hear us both. Sofiane, can you hear me? Sofiane should be joining us. So very quickly, very quickly, um, I'll just go through the different challenges of the sector. Okay, I think that's okay. Hopefully you can see. So the challenges of the sector. Well, basically what we need to do is develop and implement business models that are appropriate for the different sectors of activity. We need to take into account the different entrants, for example, the sludge from the wastewater plants. And when it comes to the food industry sector, also the chemical sector, the paper sector, these are all the subgroups that we work with uh, notably for this kind of project. And obviously it's an aspect that is very important. We absolutely have to make sure that when we're setting out these types of projects, we need to also include the maintenance work that needs to be done on our installation so that we're as competitive as possible. And in order for us to do, do this, we need to work, establish that our installation will not produce a lot of greenhouse effect, effect gases because gases because otherwise this would be very negative so we think it's very important to work on this subject with all the members of the sector and we need to implement a modular approach we've already talked about that the basic idea here is to ensure that we're able to reduce the costs to be able to optimize our operational plant because if we've got several modules several approaches um, we'll be able to reduce the maintenance period and cover the maintenance costs thanks to the fact that we're optimizing all of the installation 
And another point that I believe is important, and it's almost strategic, we have to make sure that we propose an alternative to the existing recycling solutions, methanization and incineration for waste, whatever the type of waste. And this is something that we're working on. I would say it's a form of added value that we can provide in relation to the existing solutions. And of course, what we need to look to do is increase the amount of recycling of the entrance and reduce the amount of ultimate waste so that we're able to create what I would call a virtuous circle and get as close as possible to uh, net, net zero emissions. Another challenge, I believe, is to include hydroth hydrothermal gasification into all of the renewable chemistry, green chemistry chain. We need to make sure that all of the scenarios that we have enable us to literally uh, integrate a production system into industry, into the farming world. We could talk about potassium, nitrogen, etc. All of these, all of these products need to be inserted and be part and parcel of the value chain that we're looking to create and that Joanne talked about. Next, I would argue that we need to make sure that all of the cost aspects and the income aspects guarantee the consistency of the overall production chain. What I mean by this um, is Yes, we simply have to have consistency. Over to you, Sofiane, to present this. Are you able to hear me? Yes. We can hear you very well. So, Sofiane is in charge of R&D for Le Rouen Lots, uh, Le Rouen Lots Technologies, and he's going to talk to us um, about the challenges. Okay, let me take control of the screen. It looks as though it's working. Unfortunately, I'm not able to turn my camera on for some reason. It's stuck on off, but I hope you can at least all hear me. Right. When it comes to the value chain, what's important is to identify the cost of the investment, the cost of running the installation as well. Uh, and the work that we're doing at the current time in terms of the business model working group is to clearly identify each brick, in other words, each part of the value chain. We've got the entrance family, for example, that has already been presented by Robert with the different types of entrance. They all have different typologies from a chemical perspective. These entrants, potentially speaking, can be characterized um, in a very specific way manner. They can be pre-treated as well to make them um, acceptable for our, our different uh, hydrothermal gasification processes. These are the two solutions that Gail presented to you earlier, the catalytic approach and the non-catalytic approach. Gail explained exactly how these work and what their different specific features are. Basically, once we exit from the process, you have the transformation process whereby the entrants are converted into different categories of products, solid products, liquid products. We've talked in quite some detail about the uh, valorization of phosphorus, for example, and the mineral salts. This provides a great deal of added value thanks to this process. We also have the gas-based part, the methane, the hydrogen, the CO2 aspects with a phase that makes it possible to transform and increase the amount of uh, CH4. This is all part of the catalytic or bio biological process with um, the purification process so that we have gas at the exit that can be then sent into the distribution gas distribution networks or can be used for hydrogen or biohydrogen. And given the fact that this is a process that functions at high temperatures, there can also be in situ uh, valorization of the gas for energy uh, in order to self-source the process and um, in order to guarantee the vir virtuous cycle. This is all part of the value chain and part of the LCA, the life cycle analysis that we perform. So if we now take a look at the positioning of um, hydrothermal gasification in the renewable gas process, you can see quite a lot of very interesting information. We can see that this is uh, waste that can be fermented. Uh, we've gone into some detail on this today. We also have alongside this all of the uh, pyrogasification process. This is also something that is being developed and hydrothermal gasification that will come about slightly further, further down the line via the big demonstrators that have been presented here 
topic today. This is all about liquid biomass, as you've seen, thanks to the panel that um, we've gone into detail on. Alongside this, you also have the power to gas. This is more for the recycling of what we call intermittent energy storage. Uh, energy storage. Um, this is something that we believe will take off once we see the development of um, this intermittent energy through uh, solar panels, for example, and wind turbines. Next, renewable gas and its positioning. Of course, there are lots of complementarities in terms of the processes, methanization at the point of exit from the methanizations. We have the digestates where you have the organic matters that can be recycled or valorized via many processes. And they're also a good alternative in relation to methanization. Um, hydrothermal gasification can directly treat the organic compounds, the products and the effluents rather than muck spreading taking taking place in terms of pyrogasification we have the char the organic material that is a sub product of the gasification process that can be mixed with other liquid product products aqueous products this also makes valorization possible and if the entrants are damp a liquid today then we're able to valorize them directly through the hydrothermal gasification and this is also an alternative to all of the traditional in generation technologies and also the oxidation technologies um, where more often than not we're talking about um, combustion products but if you've got um, liquid efflu effluents that can be dried then we can use them um, these these entrants or entrants can be recycled via hydrothermal gasification. So there you are this gives you an idea of all of the work that we're doing currently within the scope of the working group. Yes I'll let you I'll let you slow, show my slides if you don't mind, because we've got two or three minutes left. Very, very quickly, just to give you an idea of the value chain that has been mentioned by uh, my colleague. As you can see, this really is a virtuous cycle, virtuous also from an economic perspective. And the maximization, wherever possible, of the different product uses and of the recycling of the sub products and valorization of the sub products that we have mean that I believe in the processes that are currently being explored and tested for producing renewable energies. I think that hydrothermal gasification well and truly is the process that generates the most value because everything is used, everything is transfer transformed, everything is reused. And this is something I think that is very, very important. Next slide. So what about the main cost, the cost that we're able to avoid and also the revenue from a given project? Well, you've got all the standard costs from a CapEx, OPEX point of view. You can see all of the different costs as well that can be avoided upstream related to specific treatment of certain entrants with micro pollutants, etc. As you can see, we well and truly have a solution that is um, very different from the other sectors. For the OPEX part and for the waste transport and residue part, this also can be avoided. And this is very important in the economic in the economic equation for HG. Look at the price, look at the reference price. This potentially will evolve over time. I think a lot of action needs to be taken to ensure that gradually we bring the price down as much as we can. And next, the, the idea is to be able to Valor, valorize the mineral salts and the nitrogen as well, what we call the subproducts. These really are um, important aspects when it comes to this new sector, this new sector that we wish to gradually present to the world. I think we can now move on to the next slide. And this is the slide whereby I have to pass the floor back over to Robert and Robert is going to draw the conclusions. Sofiane, can you please move the slide forward? Thank you very much. So here, by way of conclusion, this is our roadmap as such, um, because obviously our future or our wish is to ramp everything up to the industrialization of this technology. First of all, exactly as Tristan has just explained, we want to gradually put together the first pilots and demonstration project project. Karen with GRT Gas and other partners has already launched a first product project. And we know that lots of other actors are ready to jump on board and join us with other projects in France. What we want is for all of this to be visible for everybody to understand what reality is out there, that the different private and public stakeholders join us in this approach. And by 2025, we hope to see the first industrial projects. And let me just say, 
say that we want to then see a whole flow of projects that will gradually bring us to uh, production potential by 2050 that can be quite considerable, as you can see, and quite significant alongside the other sectors that we've described for producing renewable gas. So if you don't mind, this is the last part that we wanted to focus on. These are the main challenges that we're up against in our sector. We've talked quite a lot about the pilot projects. We've said that these really will determine our future. Of course, we have to become more and more visible, but it's important for the developers as well. What we need to, to tweak is to tweak and refine the technology before we move on to the next stage, the industrial stage. Next, we do have a massive amount of work to do from a regulatory perspective. We need to try and make sure that by the end of this year, beginning of next year, we've got all the elements, all the documents ready so that we can enter into discussions with the authorities on these technologies and request its inclusion in the French leg legislative framework. We also have a lot of work to do in terms of the mechanisms according, based upon which we can obtain support from the authorities. Initially speaking, and of course, we need a small amount of support. Uh, so the initial investors, of course, are going to be the local government, and they take, they're take they the people who take the biggest risks. And um, it's important that they're alongside us, that they're willing to take these extra risks so that we're able to develop the technology. And we also have a certain number of challenges that we have to overcome, notably in terms of uh, valorization, recycling of the liquid residues and the solid residues. And all of this basically is part of the business models that we're gradually putting together. And for this, we're working we're working in a variety of sectors. We started working out with the wastewater treatment plants because we think that they are the first top use case um, this is where there's the most pressure from the actors out there in the market and what we want is to continue to work with Veolia and Saw who seem to be particularly interested in interested in the progress that we're making so thank you very much thank you very much for listening and we'd be delighted now to answer any questions that you might have thank you very much Robert um, I'm going to make sure that we make the most of the time that we have. Throughout the session, a certain number of questions have been put in the chat. Um, we're going to go through the questions in chronological, chronological order. We have one specific question. You've talked about the entrance from farms. You've talked about digestates. You've said that these products would be very good for hydrothermal gasification. What about developing this technology on the spot on the farms? Hubert. Robert, would you like to speak? Well, I don't know whether the question is designed in particular for locating the technology on the farms specifically and directly. We believe that um, we believe that for this technology, you do need a certain amount of technical know-how. There's high pressure. There are temperatures that can be rather high, particularly in the context of the methanization process. I think it's important to understand how the system works. It's not the same type of practice as farming. You know, you have to understand the technology. So we tend to think that it would be a good idea to set up small hubs, centers, local centers that will reach out and collect the raw material, rather like we go and collect milk from the farms. They will, these centers will reach out and and uh, collect the residues from the farms uh, within a radius of about 15 kilometers. And hence, they will treat the products as close as possible to the gas network so the gas can be re-injected into the network, for example. The overall business approach needs to be as effective and efficient as possible. And everybody has to benefit from the solution that is set up. What we didn't say earlier was, given the fact that we've got a combined approach, we can also, within the scope of a specific unit, to treat one type of entrant and in another one of the units or hubs I was talking about process different entrants. This technology from this perspective is highly agile, very flexible. But once we've set out a framework and decided what usage will be made of a given machine, then we have to use that, that machine for what we've decided to use it for. And obviously it's a machine that will operate 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, apart from maintenance work. So we have to look for efficiency. Next question. Thank you, Robert. Can you say a few words about how the uh, working group was compiled? And can you describe the role that each person plays? Mm, OK, let me try and answer this question. How did we put together the working group? 
Well, my initiative from the outset was to try and guarantee that I would have available a whole range of actors and stakeholders who represented the different sectors that we're interested in and that are important for our sector. I think we've been able to demonstrate this morning that we focus on all the different aspects related to the technology, the circular economy, the different processes, both upstream and downstream. Uh, we have a foot inside the door of lots of different sectors, the gas sector, the energy sector more globally. And so our approach was to bring as many people on board from a wide range of sectors. We still got a few holes in the net, as we say. Um, we'd like to have more people from the farming world because we've already got requests from certain farmers who, said, who were saying we're not able to spread our, our, digest our digestate, we'd like you to be able to help us. They have quotas, they're only able to spread part of their residues, so they would like assistance from us if possible, and it seems senseless to them to drive the product 100, 150 kilometres so that we can use it for our testing process, but we are very open-minded if you you're interested in joining us for example it's a big group a very big group of people who volunteered we don't have any legal framework that underpins what we do everybody comes because they want to provide information or make a contribution to the hydrothermal gasification sector it's a win-win situation for everybody you can't just come and sit down and listen to what other people say no the aim is to take part to give as much information as you receive and there are lots of monthly subgroups or sometimes subgroups groups that meet twice a month. We basically move forward together uh, in rank and file, and we all try and provide assistance and help wherever we can, thanks to our know-how. And uh, we basically look to contribute the skills that we've acquired in our companies. Thank you, Robert. Now I have a question. Um, we've talked about the business models. This is a question from Mrs. Clico de Monk. What minimum size do you imagine for these units, these hubs you talked about? Well, this is all very topical. topical. At the moment with Robert, we've designed a certain number of modules um, and the basic idea is that depending on the economic equation that we have for each specific area, we will then determine what we call the size of the module. Um, we'll work out the break-even point uh, uh, in terms of the number of tons that are required in order for this uh, operational unit for producing hydrothermal gasification uh, in order for it to be profitable. So we've got a certain number of um, theories that we're currently working on along these lines and we need to basically work out what is the minimum size that is profitable. We've got a rough idea, thanks to the different pilots and demonstrators, but we, we want to have uh, not just a belief, but, but certainty as to how profitable the different sized installations are. We're pretty much close to drawing our conclusions, but we haven't yet communicated on it. Okay, thank you very much, Victor. Next, we have a question concerning the environmental impact of the process itself. What, ab what about um, if evalu evaluations, for example, as to the carbon footprint? Have they been completed or not? Gael, I don't know whether you'd like to answer. We're currently performing an LCA analysis, a life cycle analysis. So uh, we should have results very shortly, thanks to uh, this. We do need very precise results, so we'll confirm them in the near future. Can I just round off what Gael said very, very clearly? This is a very important subject. And with the European Directive, for example, we have the obligation to subject ourselves to, to this LCA. And we want to as well, because we know full well that the LCA will give us um, additional information so that we can demonstrate the full advantages of this sector. For GRT Gas, for example, we've planned between now and the end of the year to launch a life cycle analysis. And this is what really does underpin uh, what will happen next. Um, we need to have as much information as possible in hand, enough data in hand, representative data. Um, the pilots, for example, will contribute to this, but also the demonstrator that our British friends have, plus additional installations. Basically, if we've got enough data to be able to launch the project then for, further for the next stages, then we, then we will do so. Okay, thank you very much, Gael. Thank you, Robert. Next, we have a question from Mr. Ferranc. This concerns the pricing, the tariffs for purchasing. So, Tristan, or Robert, would you like to round off what it says? Well, currently we don't have any tariffs. Um, as I said earlier on, 
it's all part and parcel of the work uh, to be done by the working group in the hydrothermal sector. Um, we need to contact the authorities to start talking about it. Basically, the discussions that are already underway are to launch the experimental projects as set out by the climate energy law. And the first stage will be to perform these tests. And uh, the right to experimentation is something that is etched in stone. It's part of the French law. Now it needs to actually happen. Then we need to set out a very clear framework in the knowledge, of course, that these pilot projects and these demonstration projects are going to enable us to benefit from a lighter legal framework. We won't be up against the same constraints that we, we will be up against in the industrial phase. And hence, this should enable us to get the ball rolling to implement these different projects within the space of the next two years. That's what we're hoping for anyway. And we hope that by 2025, we should have enough feedback, enough data and information to ramp things up to the industrial stage. Just a few points to conclude and I'm afraid the speaker's sound is cutting out. Um, no doubt there will be several stages, won't there? We're also talking about other subjects such as methanization and the principle according to which we've received agreement for specific prices for the initial installations that we build. Well, no doubt the prices will be specific, initially speaking. And then once we've got a bit more knowledge, a better understanding, then at that moment in time, we'll have a full grid, a full pricing grid, um, taking into account the methanization process as well. So basically, we, we need to work with, with the authorities, also with the Energy Regulation Commission, and no doubt, um, yes, there will be many stakeholders involved. Just an additional point of information from my perspective, I talked about it briefly when I gave the Dutch example. The Dutch, for example, they've been able to negotiate with their authorities, and they have a buyback contract uh, for a certain number of years. And in terms of the remuneration, it is the equivalent of what a methanizer or a methanization producer re receives in the Netherlands. Everybody is, uh, everybody benefits from exactly the same conditions. So that gives you at least an initial idea of potentially what we could introduce in France. Okay, just one question that I forgot. What progress has been made in this technology over the last 18 months? And are there problems in terms of extraction or catalyzers, uh, extraction of the mineral salts? What progress still remains to be made? Ah, OK, the technological challenges. I can guarantee there is still quite a few. We see new challenges virtually every day. It goes without saying, yes, the catalyzers, they are a main challenge. They work, they're highly active. But now what we need to establish is how stable can we make them? How stable can we make them for the whole solution to become operationally viable? That's one of the points that we're working on, but we're pretty sure that we, we will make progress on the catalyzers. Um, we're working under more gentle conditions than we will in the long run, but it enables us to gain a better understanding of how all the catalytic process functions. Also, retrieving, recovering the minerals, that's quite a challenge. We don't just recover the minerals, as we said. Uh, what we've got to do once we've recovered them is uh, recycle them, valorize them in the right in the right manner and as we we've said by 2026 we will have to be capable of recovering the phosphorus from our waste treatment plants so now we've got to find a solution for extracting the phosphorus but then afterwards we've got to recycle it into phos phosphor based products so that's work that we've only just started to do and we're working with the environmental federal office for this and i repeat this is quite a major challenge just to round off what Gael has been saying, it's important to note that each technology developer, each technology developer will gradually reach a stage in their development. We don't all make progress at the same rate. The Dutch, for example, they've got their ACW system, they've made a great deal of headway. And if all goes well, this year, 
they will virtually be able to reach the stage of industrial maturity. They're not quite there yet because, of course, they have to demonstrate that their system can work continu continuously. But this is their objective, their basic technology functions. Now, what they need to check is the durability, the sustainability of their approach. That's the last challenge, the last hurdle to overcome. And the same is true for a certain number of other stakeholders. There are already cases out there, I repeat, where they're very, very close to reaching maturity. And this is what motivates us and gives hope to all of the different actors, first and foremost, the developers. It means that this kind of approach is feasible. And this is why we are all saying that we're 100% favorable to this sector. Oh, we have another question concerning the catalyzer. Yes, it is recyclable. That being said, we've always we've also developed direct regeneration processes once the catalyzer is worn out, and that's of interest as well. Yes, it means that we can use a certain number of processes to directly regenerate it in the reactor. That that's is very clear that once it's worn out what we will do is work with the manufacturer so that we can apply methods for the recycling of the catalyzer that is essential obviously if we can't regenerate recycle the catalyzer then it's going to be very complicated to work according to this method yes it's a, a very important point we have three minutes left i think we'll take one or maybe two questions maximum because then we've uh, got something else at 11 o'clock so concerning the um the waste from the uh waste treatment plants what what would be the ideal size of the unit the hub that you'll be setting up to treat the waste well this very much goes back to the question that victor answered earlier on and in terms of the distance um we've talked about an analysis that needs to be performed um, an LCA analysis, a life cycle analysis, or the carbon content analysis. But basically what we need to do at a given moment in time is re reduce the distance or limit the distance and the amount of logistics. Now, even if we're able to say that we're producing bioenergy and the, the minimum amount of logistics is necessary, but we're still going to reduce the carbon impact of the logistics thanks to the work that we do. That's one thing. But at this stage, we can't really give a specific distance. It really will depend on what we're producing at the given site and on how big or small the site is and how big or small the um, the wastewater production plant is. All of this will need to be calculated, taking all the elements into account. Yes, just an add-on as well. As we said earlier, what we will do is define an initial approach, and this will very much be a macro-based approach. Then if we see that we're able to work with farms, say that uh, 10, 20 kilometers, Within a, in the vicinity, and if we can have that up to 500 installations in France, then it means we could, for example, capture virtually all of the French instance. This gives you a rough idea. And I think it's something that sounds quite logical and meaningful because it means we're local, but at the same time, the transport distances are very, very short. And we can use um, natural biogas fuels, for example, and this would all be very meaningful we could, we could, with one or two trucks, we could do quite a lot, quite a lot, quite easily. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. One very last question. What about the price in kilowatt hours for this kind of installation, Gale? Potentially speaking, can you give us a rough idea? Uh, per ton of dry raw material, if you can refer back to the CapEx. Well, it's several thousands of euros per ton of raw material if we talk about the capex and a few and a few hundred euros for the dry material but i don't have the details okay i tried <laughs> i try i tried to pin you down and get get an answer no no obviously what we want is to be as competitive as possible with the incineration process uh, the challenge of course will be to will be to be cheaper than them whilst processing and recycling uh, waste from a wastewater plant. Yes, obviously what we want is to at least be at the same same level as the other renewable gas producers and be cheaper than incineration. That at the end of the day is the must-have target that we've set out. It's the main target that we talk about 
um, particularly in the context of our business model, we need to demonstrate that this will be the case. And this is why our friends, so Suez and Veolia are all working with us. It really is very much at the heart of the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. It's one minute past 11. Thank you to all of the panelists for this conference. 150 participants followed the session. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for your contributions. And thank you also simply for participating in the chat with your questions. The conferences will be published and broadcast as soon as possible on the Bio360 Week site. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully next year uh, in the flesh in Nantes.